I definitely can't compete with our comedian MC for the night. I think when I'm 60 and old and gray, I'm going to be still introduced as Miss Universe Malaysia 2011. I'll be like coming on stage with my walking stick. <laughs> um, thank you guys so much. It's such a pleasure to be here again. Um, Daniel and Zikri are good friends of mine, and uh, you know, I've, I think I've known the incitement since the beginning, right? Um, yeah, so it's exciting. Um, and thanks for staying. I know it's a late, uh, late night. It's Friday. It's been raining, so it's really nice that you guys are still here. I'd like to be all comical and funny, but I'm going to talk about uh, refugees and um, the school that I started in 2008 in Malaysia, in Gombak, which is not too far from here. So slightly more serious topic. Um, but yeah, I'm not going not gonna to speak too long, just keep it short and sweet and share a little bit about what we're doing. So my university friend Shikin and I, we started, we started Fuji School because we wanted to put a pen in the hand of a child. Really quite simply, we wanted to put a pen in the hand of a child. And I was shocked when I met, um, I, was, I was shocked when I met this family. It was 2008, I was uh, hosting this in-house documentary for you in HCR, and we went to this house, and there were four Somali siblings living together. And not, not two years old and three years old, they were talking 11, 12 year olds. They couldn't write their name, they couldn't read, they couldn't speak. So we were devastated. And I remember walking away from that, from their home thinking, I can't just walk away from this. I can't do nothing about this. Something has to be done. And I, I didn't ever want, I mean, I knew about the war in Somalia. I knew about civil wars and that there are, there's a such thing called child soldiers. Where instead of them going to school and learning, people put guns in their hands and they go around killing people. And so I never wanted it ever to be an option for these kids to choose a gun over choosing a pen. Education had to be the way. They had to move forward, move upwards, to have a zest for life, for learning, and to want to educate themselves. Of course, eight years ago when I started, when I started the school and got involved with refugees, I didn't realize that for a lot of these, a lot of these kids, it's it's a very traumatic experience. They go through something that's unimaginable for us. And I, I realized that um, along the way that, you know, it was, well, what it meant to be a refugee child and that these kids were not able to dream out loud. They weren't able to think about a future. There was no such thing as hope. There was no such thing as imagination. No one wants to be a refugee. I think we need to make that very clear. No one wants to be a refugee. Millions of people have to flee their homes, run away from everything they have. Their lives, their homes, their valuables. They lose family members. People die around them. They witness war, they witness conflict. They leave everything, and it's a very, very traumatic experience. They leave all of this, and they are forced to flee their home countries. That's like us forced to flee in Malaysia, if you're Malaysian. But you're not welcome anywhere else. And so if you look at Malaysia, the case in Malaysia, they are unwelcome settlers in our country. They're here. No one really wants them to be here. And it's a, it, they are handicapped because as adults, they can't work. So you're not allowed to legally have any form of employment. You, as a parent, you can't provide for your family. You feel unproductive. What can you do? Nothing. Can you earn money? No. Can you provide? No. Can you send your kids to school? No. And for the children, they can't go to government schools. So they're left there with no education, if they can afford to go to an international school, they probably wouldn't be in a refugee situation. So they're left absolutely schoolless with no option of an education, which as well as crippling. And for these youth and for these kids, they really, you know, imagine put yourself in their shoes. You lose hope, you've no direction. What am I doing? What's the point of life? Where, what's happening tomorrow? Why do I even need to get out of bed? We all have those days where we just really don't want to get out of bed. And this is what it's like every day for these, for these, for these children. So what happens is you have this state of hopelessness and helplessness, which creates this victim state of mind. It's a victim sort of mentality. And you just get very comfortable being a victim of your situation. The reality is that children are the biggest victims of this situation. They are the biggest victims and very often they suffer in silence and they get exploited. People take advantage of them, they suffer, and by the time you realize, it's almost too late. In development work, we always talk about 
the basic needs for survival. Well, any guesses? What are the basic needs for survival? Exactly. Food, water, shelter. You can survive a week or so without food. With, without water, you're going to die in a couple of days. So yes, it is a matter of life and death. But my argument is that education is a need, a basic need for survival. Without education, it's a very, it's not a, it may not be a physical death, but it's a very slow, painful death. And without an education, without access and education for children, are we not then setting them up? Instead of setting them up for success, we're setting them up for failure. To bring a child into this world, 21st century, no access to a schooling, what is their future? What is the possibility? And so after many years, we realized that there are two main areas that we need to work on to transform these children, these refugee children, away out of their victim state of mentality. The first one is overcoming crippling, this very crippling victim stigma that a lot of these refugee children carry with them. It's a burden. And the second one is being empowered to take back control of their lives. And that is empowered with the right kind of tools, the right confidence, and that they are proactive. Even in a situation of instability where you don't know what tomorrow holds, you're able to then take back some control and you're able to say, no, I can control my future. I can look ahead and I can see beyond today, see beyond tomorrow. And this leads me to the first factor that, you know, it was a re revelation to me in a way. And the word is choice. It's a common word. We make choices all day, every day. We don't even realize we make choices. I mean, who chose to come here tonight? Right? You made the choice. You chose what to have for dinner. You chose where to work. You chose where to go to university. We're making choices all the time. And so for these kids coming to Fuji school, it was finally a moment where they had to make a choice. They chose to come to our school. And for, for most of these people, choice wasn't really a big factor in their lives before this. Once they chose to come to Fuji school, it was a commitment. And then there were rules and regulations they had to abide by. But it was that choice they made to come. A friend's father once told me, and he said, Deborah, don't be so foolish. Don't be so foolish to not take advantage of making decisions and choices in your life. Majority, majority of this world, billions of people, live every day not able to make decisions for themselves. They have to take what life has given them. They don't get to go to school. They have to work. Um, they've got to take care of their families. There are, they have no water, they have no food. Decisions are made for them, they just have to deal with it. But we are privileged, everyone here today in this room, we are privileged, we make choices all the time and we need to value that ability to make decisions for ourselves. But the reality is at Fuji School, for many of these refugee kids, they were that majority, the majority who never got to make choices for themselves. They had no options, they had no outlook on life. And so, when they came to Fuji School, they were given the choice to commit the choice to be part of something, the choice to work hard, to accept help, and also the choice of learning opportunities. We don't ram stuff down their throats. It's an option, it's a choice, and they need to appreciate and value it. That is important. To realize the privilege of making choices in life. To see opportunities, possibilities, and also eventually to create outcomes for themselves. There's an example I, I, I mention all the time, and it's something that is it's, it's stuck in my memory. Um, back in 2009, when I first started the school, I didn't know how to entertain the kids. I'm not a teacher, I'm not an educator, so I gave them all coloring paper and crayons, something my mom did with me when I was a kid. And I said, draw, have fun. And half an hour later, the paper was blank. An hour later, I was struggling to get them to like put pen to paper, and I was I was dumbfounded. What, what, what does this mean? Why can't they, you know, just draw a tree, a house, I mean, a dog, you know? Um, their imaginations were dead. There was, they were alive, but their imagination, they were so shut down. Creativity, imagination, thinking about stuff. Forget about thinking out of the box. They weren't even thinking to begin with. That was so shut off. And that huge transformation from that point where, where they were stagnant and, and closed off and dead to this. To art. This is a couple of weeks ago where 
at one point there was nothing on the paper and today we have our students taking part in art classes, we have them expressing themselves, creativity, it's, what is, we, we spoke about this earlier, what is your opinion, why do you feel this, why is pink your favorite color? It's having an opinion and that your opinion counts, it matters. And today, they create art pieces like this, which surprised me, and there's hidden talent there. So it's also that realization that everyone has potential. It's untapped potential. We just need the opportunity, the platform to show, to express. And the sad part is there is a big majority of people in this world who don't have that. It's always the opportunity. And that's why, coming back to the element of choice, it's, I'm not here to, you know, to baby you and I'm not here to, you know, a poor thing, victim, let me just give everything to you. No, it's, it's choice, it's opportunity. And can you appreciate it? Can you learn to appreciate it? Can you learn to take, uh, to not take it for granted? And that is something I think for all of us here, we, if we fall, we slip into that state so easily as well. So that is so much of what we're trying to do. But in making choices, we also realize that it, it, it always came back to this one question, the standard question of why am I here? Why, why, why am I here? Why do I need to come to school? Why do I need to be on time? Why do I need to study? To the, a lot of these kids, school is irrelevant. It was irrelevant to their survival and it's relevant, it was irrelevant in Malaysia and when they started school. They did not know why they were doing what they were doing. So in that case, it's pointless, you know, so we realized that we weren't just a school, we couldn't just teach them one plus one equals two. We had to dig deeper, we had to go below the surface, and we had to, we had to un, sort of unravel and, and peel off the layers of trauma, the layers of instability, of confusion, of hopelessness, of helplessness, of, of fear, of sadness, you know, the lack of emotion. Um, and we had, to, we had to peel all of this off, and we did this very much through workshops. We, dis we discovered that the personal development workshops was an amazing vehicle, an avenue for us to utilize to do this. And we did workshops targeting the girls, um, targeting self-confidence, self-value, why are you happy? But one of the first ones um, that we didn't do, but we partnered, this is the pilot project of Incitement, um, and they came to Fuji School and they ran this, and we discovered, it was really amazing, I discovered that we saw huge transformation in some of our students. It was, it was really one of those like, light bulb moments. It was that, wow, you know, you mean these things like sitting in a group of people on the ground and talking and public speaking and talking about random things and it, you mean it makes it, it has an impact? It can change a person's attitude? It can improve someone's performance in school? And then it was this realization that, okay, this really works, so we have to invest in this. This is an important part in building these kids up, because without this aspect of personal development, forget about the education, forget about teaching them math and getting them to come to school on time. Forget about all of that if they aren't, if they aren't vested, if they're not present here. So that was really the big moment for us. But why is this aspect so important? Because we know that Evidence has shown that hanging around people that are motivational, inspiring, that are happy, guess what? It's going to rub off on you. It's going to rub off on you and it has a positive impact. And so when the kids, the more time these students spend time with people like that, it impacted them and rubbed off on them. And also it was the kickstarting of the process of self-discovery. A lot of us don't discover ourselves till we're much older. And even then, it's a lifelong journey of self-discovery. It never ends. And so if for these kids, it was suddenly, okay, I'm having confidence, I matter, my opinions matter. But then it was also start, the start of them asking questions. It's, why am I here? What makes me happy? What am I passionate about? What do I think? What are my opinions? What are, what is, who am I? What is my identity? And they started asking these questions and they started tackling these questions. And, and that meant that their minds were thinking. And once that stuff started happening, who am I, what am I doing, even though they had not answered the questions, but the fact that they were asking questions, it gave them more clarity on their situation. They were talking about it, and it gave them clarity, and so they ended up becoming more purposeful, more driven, more focused, and that, that in turn um, sort of benefited their performance in school, because then they were attending classes, they're committed, they're engaged, they want to be there. So it really was the element of choice, choosing to be there, understanding why they were there, 
building themselves up, impacted our education. And this is sorry, just a slide just for And it was just it's investing, yeah, and it's just investing in themselves. So we then took, we then moved on to academic side, where we have we launched a program called 20th Century Skills. In a nutshell, it's based on online learning. There's so much information online. So online learning, learning and teaching the kids to teach themselves and global citizenry courses. So empowering these kids to learn, with all of that strength building, empowering these kids then go online, teach themselves, access knowledge, access information, but be willing to do it because that is the future. We can do so much in the classroom, but they have to be motivated to do this for themselves. And we believe that this, this is the new, these are the new students, these are the new youth, these are the people who have access and want to understand how to teach themselves, they can do it. And a quick example of that was Nawa, one of our students in sight, we know her very well. She started off just like most of the other kids at the school, you know, didn't speak much English, pretty much shut down, nothing, you know, you spoke to her, nothing really stood out. She even quit school once to work in a DVD shop, packaging DVDs. And finally, we convinced her to stop and come back to school. And she's been, she's worked so hard, she's a mentor at the school, she's a buddy, she volunteers at the school, and is involved in so many of the extracurricular programs. So, uh, such a passionate person that um, she worked so hard and without any form of formal qualification, just the stuff that she's done at Fuji School, what we do, which is nothing like accredited and formal, she was able to put together her resume and apply for a very special refugee program at Nottingham University in, in Malaysia, and she got accepted into a foundation course at Nottingham University. In fact, two of our students. <laughs> So, so really, this is when you see, like, I talk about choice, you know, like, choice is just a, I mean, what's the big deal? Choice, personal development, that strength of character, that focus and commitment to even though you're in a situation of instability, even though you don't know where you're going to be tomorrow, will you get resettled to another country? Are you going to sit in the later for the next five years of your life as an undocumented person, more or less? But the fact of the matter is she was passionate and guess what? Results, impact got into the university foundation and she has positively impacted every single person who works at Fuji School. The four-year-olds, the ten-year-olds, her peers, teachers, everyone has been positively hit by her that. Because now they know that, guess what, there is light at the end of the tunnel, there is hope, you can do it, you can imagine, and it all happens. Quickly, this is the story of Ahmed of guy in the white t-shirt. Moving backwards, he, he's now in Turkey studying, but just before that, he was in Somalia. And in Somalia, he moved back to Somalia. He was my first year in 2008. And major transformation. In Somalia, when he was there, he decided to start the hashtag the Somali Street Children Project. He made friends with the, uh, the street children, hundreds of them. He was documenting their stories, taking their photos, and wanted to put together like a expose of sorts, a report on the situation in Somalia and his kids. And this is a boy in 2008 who couldn't, like, couldn't speak, couldn't write, couldn't communicate, had absolutely no, like nothing, nothing going for him. And fast forward seven, eight years later, look at this. And he was not even just doing this, he wanted to, I just heard he actually was talking about starting Insight in Somalia, right? Wanted to initiate, he started Insight in Somalia. But the, the scary part of this project was, and you know, and he ended up having to leave the country because of it, was because this, these three children were basically um, preyed on um, by people to use to harvest their organs illegally. So they were kidnapped off the street, and organs were cut out of them, and they were just chucked back on the street or left to die, and they were just missing. I mean, hundreds of them, and they would go, and no, they didn't matter to anyone. And he was community, he was talking to them and finding out all of this, all of their stories and wanting to expose this. And because it was so dangerous that his uncle and Somali basically just confiscated all the photos, all the reports, all the way and they said, you're going to Turkey next week. So this is a boy who had a bad life, had a, had an unfortunate start to things, ends up going back to Somali to try to help others out. You know, I mean, come on, like, why even care? Why even bother? But it's impacting so deep and such a passion for others and for living that, you know, I don't know, people before profit, thinking about the other person, these things matter. So 
just such strong stories that really verify everything that we do for these kids and building these kids up with people who will be game changers, and which is why I say to them, you grew up in Somalia, you were born there, you lived in Saudi Arabia, you went to Ethiopia, you ended up in Malaysia, you probably will end up in Canada or Australia. That is an amazing advantage. Don't be a victim of your situation. Be a victor. Use that as an advantage. The fact that you are agile, you are adaptable, you are flexible, you can make it work wherever you are. And to use everything that you've learned in Malaysia, all the skills, all the hardships, the good and the bad, use that to your advantage wherever you may be. And that will and will be stronger for it. And when we see when see it like that, transformation happens. And I just recently watched this movie, London Has Fallen. And if you watched it, I think they ended, ended it with this line. <laughs> I'm paraphrasing it, I still get borrowed it. Um, you know, it's, I, just, I don't know, it's, it's a simple statement, but it stuck with me. It's our responsibility to engage with the world. You know, I mean, I run a refugee school and I'm sick and tired of watching BBC and CNN. It depresses me. I put on the TV in the morning between Trump and CNN. I mean, like, that's an entertainment pleasure. I mean, I enjoy my mornings now, but a little bit better. But it's, I want to turn it off. I want to disconnect. I want to disengage sometimes, to be honest. And I know I can't. I know I won't. But I want to, you know? Because it's depressing. It's really, it's negative. It's sad when you look around you. But it is our responsibility to not do that. We have to engage in the world. And it's people like all of you guys here who care enough to be here on a Friday night and on Zoom. And, and, <laughs> are we a bit too old? Um, no, but to care enough, to care enough to be here tonight and, and to make that difference to one, the power of one. One person can change a life and it's this ripple effect. It never, it never, there's no such thing as changing one person's life. In fact, that statement is completely false because you can never just change one man's life. It is always a ripple effect. So yes, yeah, the London has fallen statement just, yeah, it's a good mantra I think to have and to, and, you know, to whenever you feel that it's just getting hard, getting too tough, to, to think of that. Thank you.